Coming Back is a listener-supported podcast. To support the show and get exclusive access to podcast swag, giveaways, private grief hangouts, and more, head on over to patreon.com slash Shelby for Scythia. Support the show for as little as $1 per month and change or cancel your support at any time. Thank you so much for listening. Hi there, and welcome to Coming Back, a podcast about coming back to life after death, divorce, diagnosis, and more. On today's show, I'm talking to Kate Manser, the brains behind the cult sticker following You Might Die Tomorrow. After four back-to-back losses, Kate was jolted back to life with an extreme sense of urgency to make her life one she loves. Also on the show today, I'm sharing my five favorite grief books that you should read in 2019. I'm Shelby Forsythia, an intuitive grief guide who speaks, writes, and teaches powerful truths on grief and loss. My mom's death in 2013 set me on the path to becoming a lifelong student of grief, and I use what I learned to equip others with the knowledge to heal and remind them that they are not alone. Because even through grief, we are growing. Let's get started. Hi there, grief growers, and welcome to Coming Back This Week. Thank you so much for tuning in with me today. Just a quick reminder before I get into the meat of the top of the show that this month's live grief support hangout is happening Monday, January 28th at 8 p.m. Central. To join us, all you have to do is pledge $1 or more per month over on patreon.com slash Shelby for Scythia. This is such a connecting and grounding time and such a great way beyond the podcast to feel seen and supported and loved on in the midst of your grief. It's one of my favorite times of the month. I always look forward to this hour long get together with all of you listeners from all over the world. It's just so, so cool. So I hope you will join us. And you can always find a link to my Patreon page in the show notes or at my website, shelbyforsythia.com. So something really neat I wanted to share with you today is something that I actually do every year. I'm not sure if I've ever mentioned it on this podcast, but definitely around the Facebook corners, if you follow me on social media, all that jazz, you know that I am an absolute lover of books. I love them. Uh, And I didn't always love books. After the forced required reading of high school and college, I kind of let my love of reading fall by the wayside. I kind of forgot that I loved reading. There was a temporary book love amnesia happening uh, in the years after high school and college. And I picked up a book on a whim from the place where I worked in 2014, which was an advertising firm here in Chicago. And there was like an employee lending library. And the book that I picked up, ironically enough, in the first year after I lost my mom was The Happiness Project. And Admittedly, I wasn't looking to be happy so much as I was looking to try to find ways to be happier than I was, which if you're grieving, you know, those are two very different things. It's not how can I be happy again, because that seems nearly impossible in the aftermath of loss. It's how can I be a little bit better tomorrow than I am today? And not in um, not in a shallow way, not in a false striving way, but just I needed some glimpses of hope and I needed them to be doable. And what's really neat about this book, The Happiness Project by Gretchen Rubin, is that the things that she says, she does a lot of self-study for her own happiness, but some of the things she said just struck me like a lightning bolt. And I learned in one of her later books, she actually calls this a lightning bolt realization, something that flips your habits overnight, but something that strikes you so profoundly that it instantly changes your life. And this lightning bolt moment I had while reading The Happiness Project, her book, was I can I can start reading again. She had an exercise printed in her book about a lot of the things that make us happy as adults were things that we love to do as children. And one of my most fond memories, and this incorporated my mom as well, which is why it's super fitting, was my mom, my sister, and I all going to our downtown library and checking out books. And at the time, I mean, I was in elementary school, so like Nancy Drew, Harry Potter, they were at the top of my list. And my mom actually constructed a reading nook behind our couch that she and my dad, like the adults could not reach it. Uh, But my sister and I would tuck back there with these huge pillows and a basket full of books 
And every week in the summer, we would go to the library. And that was like an exploration. We could choose whatever we wanted. And reading this in Gretchen Rubin's book, that the things that made me happy as a kid could also make me happy as an adult. I'm like, I could go to the library again. All of a sudden, I was struck with like, oh my God, I have this freedom. I'm an adult. I live in a big city. There's libraries everywhere. Uh, and there's no teachers or professors trying to tell me what I'm allowed to read. And so this realization, this lightning strike opened me up to this world of possibilities of I can start reading books that I love again. But I struggled initially when I showed up to the library because I was like, well, what interests me now? It's been so long since I've chosen books that I love to read and just read them for pleasure that I I had no kind of idea where to start. I couldn't see the first step on the path. And what really interested me in the first year after my mother's death turned out to be books about grief. I wanted to know how to do it. I wasn't necessarily looking for a how-to book because there really is no step-by-step formula for coping with loss because I think everybody tackles it in their own ways. And I've learned that for myself as well, doing the show and speaking to all of you out in the world. But the stories of others who are grieving, not only do they help me feel like I'm less alone, but a lot of times, kind of like Gretchen Rubin's book, they have these tidbits of wisdom or these lightning bolt realizations, or you said that better than I could have ever said that. And oh my God, you put words to that thing that I'm feeling, and this is incredible. And uh, and books just became that for me. And ever since then, I have been a voracious adult reader, and I absolutely love nonfiction books about grief, whether they're memoirs, whether they're self-help. I just suck them up. And it's one of the big reasons I have so many authors here on the show as well, is I just love all that wisdom compressed into this this totem of knowledge that can get passed around and shared and highlighted and pulled from and and absorbed in a way that not all other grief experiences can. And it's just so cool. Books are so cool. I know so many of you out there share my love of reading and of books. So surmise all this to say, summing all this together, uh, every single year since I started my business, Shelby for Scythia Intuitive Grief Guide, I have done a once a year roundup of all the books I loved that I read. And the number, the, the sweet spot number seems to be five. So I did a roundup in 2017. I did a roundup in 2018. And this year I am presenting to you my 2019 list. And so these are books that I'm recommending that you read in 2019. They're not necessarily books that are coming out in 2019, but they're the best five books that I read in 2018 that I think you might enjoy for 2019. And here on the show today, I'm just going to read off the titles and the authors of these books. I'm not actually going to read off any of my uh, descriptions or insights or, or my summations of it, but you can find those. You can always find these over on my blog, which is located like all things at shelbyforsythia.com. And you can see kind of my insights while reading some of my favorite chapters, which books are darker than others, which ones are more personal stories and which ones are overarching. Um, but I have five books that I absolutely just devoured and loved reading in 2018 that I really think if you haven't picked them up yet, you should pick them up in 2019. So the first book that I really, really enjoyed in 2018 was You Are Not Alone by Debbie Augenthaler. And many of you will remember Debbie as a podcast guest last spring. And I just, I get requests from authors to be on the show a lot. And I was just blown away by the structure of Debbie's book. And many of you remember we talked about it and I pulled, you know, quotes from some of her chapters while we were speaking. And it's just, it's such a cool book. Uh, definitely check that one out in 2019. Uh, Another book that I absolutely love, took a little bit longer to read because it was um, heavy on the vocabulary, but I weirdly enjoyed that challenge, is called H is for Hawk by Helen McDonald. The third book that I really, really loved reading uh, that actually a coworker recommended to me was When Breath Becomes Air. And I hope I don't butcher his last name, but his name is Paul Kalaninthi. I hope that's correct. And his wife's name who wrote the afterword, her name is Lucy Kalaninthi. So I hope you'll pick up that book as well. That one's a very short read if you're looking for something quick. Uh, the fourth book that I 
totally absorbed, and I actually got to see the author speak in Chicago in 2018, is Tuesdays with Maury by Mitch Album. And this is another quick read that's just so delightful. There's a movie of it as well, if you'd like to check that out. Uh, and you can actually see interviews with Maury Schwartz, who is the gentleman that died in the book uh, on YouTube. I believe they're floating around on the internet somewhere, which is really cool. Uh, and then the last book that I absolutely adored reading in 2018 that was very heavy, very twisty of a book uh, is called A Mother's Reckoning by Sue Claybold. And she was one of the mothers of uh, the Columbine shooters. She was the mother of one of the Columbine shooters. And this is her little reckoning with the aftermath of the day she found out her son was one of the Columbine shooters and completed suicide that day, and then her life in the aftermath. And it is a hell of a book, let me tell you. So if you'd like to see full synopses or my perspective on these five books, and or if you'd like access to the other two roundups that I've written on grief books that I love, all you have to do is go to shelbyforsythia.com and click blog. And it should be the first post that shows up for you. And then of course, the previous ones you can scroll down and see uh, posted in years past. And of course, if you follow me on Facebook as well, I'll be posting these both in my public page, which is Shelby for Scythia Intuitive grief guide. And I'll be posting this in my private Facebook group too, if you're there as well, which is called the Grief Growers Garden. And that's where listeners of this podcast, people who have lost a loved one, go to hang out, share losses, share resources, all that jazz. So if you're looking for something to read in 2019 uh, from somebody whose judgment you sort of kind of trust because they're talking on a podcast that you listen to every week, uh, try these on. Try these on, see if they work for you. I'd love to hear what you think. And also, if you have book recommendations, grief or otherwise, uh, for 2019 for me to read and review for next year, I would absolutely love to hear from you. Shelby at shelbyforsythia.com. I usually average anywhere from 30 to 40 books a year. And so I absolutely just love reading. Public transit's a godsend. I read so many books on the train. <laughs> uh, so thrilled to share these with you this week, grief growers. Next up, my conversation with Kate Manzer, who wants to remind you that you might die tomorrow. Kate Manzer is just so happy to be alive. After being rocked by tragic deaths in her life, she experienced a radical shift in perspective. Thinking about your death makes your life better. She is the creator of You Might Die Tomorrow, a project that spreads the idea that thinking about your death reminds you to live. Kate has studied the philosophy, psychology, and sociology of mortality awareness, but the most important research she's done has been to live her own life with urgency, gratitude, and joy. She's created a global following for You Might Die Tomorrow, hosts a profound deathbed meditation, which she's sharing with us today, and her book, also called You Might Die Tomorrow, is coming out in early 2019. Kate, I am so delighted to have you on coming back today because my introduction to you and your work was with the phrase, a cult sticker following. And so I had to know more about that and what that had to do with grief and death and life and loss and just had to have you on the show for that reason. So uh, welcome to coming back. And if you could, please, we'll start where we start with all of our guests with your loss story. But I promise listeners, we will get into the stickers very shortly. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So my loss story um, started in high school. I lost a, a couple of friends, but what really radically shifted my life was three years ago, I lost three um, people around my same age in rapid succession, all in the span of one year. My 27-year-old uh, boss at Google died in a cliff diving accident. My uh, hus then husband's cousin died of uh, cancer. He was 36. And then um, a friend of mine from college was killed at 27. She was walking across the road and was hit by a drunk driver. And I had never really thought too much about death prior to that. In fact, I spent most of my high school years thinking that I was invincible. Um, but at around 28 years old, 29 years old, I had this really harrowing year and it really sent me into a death anxiety tailspin where I became so preoccupied with death and how scary it was and how unknown and how anyone can go at any minute that it really just started to take over my life. I would think about it 
driving through intersections. I couldn't sleep because I was, um, ha- you know, having these visions in my mind about my mom dying and what would happen, the whole scenario after that. And, um, and that was really just, it clouded the beauty of life. And then everything changed when there was actually one more death that occurred. My friend and colleague at Google, Dan Friedenberg, was climbing Mount Everest uh, when the Nepal earthquake hit, and he died in an avalanche that day. And this was, again, like the fourth um, unexpected death of a relatively young person in a short period of time. But this time I was angry. I was like, climbing Mount Everest is something you do electively. And he chose to do this and he, you know, now he took himself, he took himself out of the world. But as I thought more about it, that was where the real, um, the real transformation occurred. And I'll stop there because that was really, you know, after I went through this anger and this death anxiety, um, I had a realization, uh, that I think will be really helpful for your listeners. That's a cool place to stop. And I love your self-awareness there. Um, I want to talk about the concept of death anxiety, because this is not something that gets talked about a lot or maybe even at all in the grief sphere. Um, I talked about it a little bit, actually about a year ago, uh, this time in 2018. And I talked about the concept of becoming hyper, I called it mortality aware after Mm -hmm. somebody that you love dies. And it sounds like this is exactly what you went through. Like somebody dies and you're like, oh shit, that's going to happen to me too. And not just me, but every single other person around me and all of them are going to go have to go through this process of some kind of tragedy where their physical body's no longer working, some kind of, you know, death or a memorial. And then the aftermath of, you know, people having to clean out your stuff and, you know, fill in for you at work and like all these other things that like death kind of sets off this a tidal wave of actions. It's a, it's a ripple effect in the world. When somebody dies, they don't just die and they're gone. It's, it's this, these waves and circles of people that radiate out from them. And I, I don't know, it's sometimes it's overwhelming to think about when you realize like, this is going to happen to me and to everyone I, I know. Can you speak more on like what that feels like in your body and how it like manifested in your world? Oh, it was, it was awful. Uh, really. I mean, it was, you know, I have not experienced in my life, uh, what I I've heard you talk about on the show before a primary loss, like a a parent or a sibling or a a spouse. Um, these were all, I guess you could call them secondary losses. They were, you know, uh, varying levels of close and, um, not as close friends. Um, but the death anxiety that I experienced was, uh, it took over my life to a point that I think is not on the level of experiencing primary loss, but pretty close to where um, I couldn't really function in a way. Uh, like I said, it was just, it would take my mind over um, throughout the day at various points. And these these really kind of awful movies would go off in my mind of like, I would imagine my then husband that I had gotten the unexpected call that he died. And I would imagine, um, you know, going to Brazil for his funeral and what I would tell his parents and, you know, all of these things. And, and to answer your question, it, it was a visceral experience as I think grief so often is manifested in our bodies. Um, the death anxiety for me was, was as well, but I think that the level to which that experience was uncomfortable was important for me, uh, in the realization that I had, uh, soon after the fourth death. Uh, because that discomfort was really, um, really showed me uh, the other side of death that I soon realized. This is a question that just popped into my brain, but what was it like? I'm 26 years old. You were 28 when all these thoughts were circling around in your head and these three major people died and then a fourth shortly after. Um, What was it like being 28 and then watching other 28 year olds without these thoughts in their heads operating in normal, quote unquote, normal life. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, wow. I haven't really thought about that very much. It's a beautiful question. I think on one hand I was, uh, you know, just so in, in it, in this death anxiety that it didn't, uh, really cross my mind that everyone wasn't thinking about this. But on the other hand, I did see people kind of like floating through life, not thinking about death. And I was a little bit envious of them in, in some ways. 
Yeah, I think I asked that question because uh, in my experience and a lot of 20-somethings that come on the podcast, there's this, um, there's almost like a righteous bitterness that comes with experiencing death mm. or knowing death in your 20s. And of course, knowing death at any age kind of makes you angry at the people around you and like, why hasn't the world stopped turning and why is no one worried about this? And it just makes you, it made me yeah. in, at 21 want to go up and like shake people and like, don't you understand? This is the way it is. <laughs> We're all going to die. Like it just, um, and yeah. so I wondered, you know, cause death anxiety is something that can be severely overwhelming as you said, but also it's in stark contrast to the way most of the rest of the world rotates. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that, um, there's, there's a lot of different ways to process mortality awareness and having come from what I think are kind of the three or four main camps, uh, number one being just like pretending like death doesn't exist. <laughs> number two being this death anxiety, um, that I know is actually really common. I think everyone experiences some death anxiety at some point of varying degrees. And then the third camp, which is perhaps uh, grief, which is a, a very different type of mortality awareness. And then the fourth camp, um, which is something that I hope to help um, people experiencing grief on this podcast today, is how mortality awareness can be a source of inspiration to live and, um, and vibrancy in life. Let's get into your realization or this transitional moment for you. What was it and what did it look like? Yeah, I had come from this place of, like I said, just being consumed by that fear of death. Like, when is it? Where is it? How is it going to happen? It's so mysterious. And I think if something is cloaked in mystery, it's naturally anxiety producing. And then Dan died in, on Everest. And again, I hit that anger point at first uh, that he had elected to do something that was so dangerous. And he was such a vibrant person. I was so angry that he had chosen something that had this big risk of taking him away from us, taking, taking him away from the world. Um, but as I thought more about it, I realized that climbing Everest is not something that you just, you know, do on an average weekend or like <laughs> you just pick up on a Saturday. It's something that takes a tremendous amount of um, contemplation. It's very expensive. It requires uh, an intense amount of physical training. And it's something that you do really mindfully. And as I contemplated that, I realized that Dan had thought long and hard about climbing Everest and he decided that, and he knew the risks, and he decided that for him, he had to climb Mount Everest in order to truly live and that it was something of a, probably a die, die situation. Like either live, um, don't, don't climb Mount Everest and stay on the ground and, and live out of alignment with your values and authenticity or climb Mount Everest and take the risk of dying. And ultimately that is what happened, but he died, um, in accordance with his, what was important to him in his sense of adventure. And I also realized that with all of these young people dying around me that like, I'm spending so much time worrying about when I'm going to die and uh, in that intersection, I'm afraid that I'm going to get T-boned and that'll be the end. But I realized like, you know, Dan died on Everest. I could die in that intersection. I could die like climbing the stairs. I'm a very clumsy person. And so with that realization that I don't have any control over that, which I've been putting so much thought and energy and anxiety into, uh, all of that just really transformed into a zeal to live because I said, you know what, if I have no guarantee of how long I'm going to live and when or where my death will come, the thing I do have control over is how I live until that mystery moment comes. And, and that was the profound shift for me. So in my brain, as you're telling this story of kind of the waking up, the realization or like, um, putting the pieces together. I get this envisioning of like the other half of the story where it's like, and then I woke up and I quit my job and I started doing things and I climbed mountains and you took up horseback riding and all these things that you've always wanted to do. And did your life suddenly look like your ideal life? Did you decide that the life you were living was already your ideal life? I, I guess um, the question I'm nagging at is what, if anything, changed in your world after that? Everything. Oh my gosh, everything. With that one realization, it didn't just correct that 
or correct that period in my life that I had that anxiety, it radically shifted the way that I live in and look at the world Um, because everything became scarce. Time especially became very scarce. And so it therefore like raised in value. It's like supply and demand, I guess. And, um, and so, yeah, everything changed for me. My outlook, number one, first and foremost was the big thing that changed. I loved loved and love harder. I take more calculated risks. I try to approach each day with joy. And I did actually uh, quit my job at Google. I left Google and I traveled around the world for two years. I started writing the You Might Die Tomorrow book, started the you know, the blog, um, you know, started this cult sticker following that you mentioned. Um, but it sounds really, really idyllic. You know, my, my life wasn't terrible before I started. My life was and still is wonderful. Um, it's the perspective that really shifted. And I just actually ha- had a, a realization the other day about what happens after a sh- after a spiritual awakening. And I wrote this whole like blog post entry about how like it sounds magical and it is, but then you find out that it takes work just like everything else, like <laughs> gratitude and meditation and really working at finding joy and, and all of that. But um, in the scope of living like you might die tomorrow, which is what I tried to do, it all seems worth it to me. I'm laughing because the idea of of what happens after a spiritual awakening, I've run into this wall before where I'm like, I've had an awakening. This is awesome. And then you wake up and like, damn it, mm-hmm. I have to put this into like reality now. <laughs> I have to manifest this <laughs> I know. in some way or or like I have to pr- take it from my brain and like push it into my reality. Like now I have to live it. Now that I've been given the gift of the awakening, now I have to like do something about it. I like know. damn. <laughs> yeah. Like what a rip and off. Then we have to figure out how to do <laughs> Yeah. And then we have to figure out how to do that with compassion because like just because we have an awakening doesn't mean we're not like sunshine and rainbows every single day. Like life is still really damn hard. And, um, and so having compassion with ourselves, just like in the grief process that there it's like two steps forward, even if it's like 10 steps forward, you're going to go eight steps back at some point. Can you speak more on that? Um, because I, I got glimpses of that when you were like, my life is wonderful. Um, but I know that all of our lives will continue to hold elements of pain and grief in the day to day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think one of my favorite sayings, uh, is, I think I made it up. I don't know, but I say perspective is a hell of a drug. Oh my uh, gosh, I love I'm writing that down. Yeah. yeah, it's a hell of a drug and it's my favorite one because man, like it's so easy to get caught up in like the washing machine of life and all like the little things we have to do like, you know, cleaning out our closet, which I'm actually looking at my disaster of a closet right now and emptying the dishwasher and like making a dentist appointment. It's so easy to get caught up in all of that. And even the greater stuff, like what people think of us and if we're making the right decision and, uh, you know, are we in the right career? What do we want to do with our lives? But death offers perspective like nothing else can. Uh, That's what I found. And so in terms of like maintaining that sense of spiritual awakening or just like, you know, trying to like be a good human, um, death is the number one thing that helps me do that because in death, everything falls away. If you imagine yourself, um, how you're going to look at your life when you're on your deathbed, for example, uh, and you look back at the present moment, you can look at it with a new set of eyes from your deathbed as opposed to just looking around now and being like, oh my God, this is my life. There's so many things. How do I sort it out? And from your deathbed, you're like, okay, here's the things that are important to me. It seems more clear and more simple. And um, yeah, that that death perspective is the number one way that I keep myself sane in life. How do you keep the death anxiety from turning into time anxiety? Mm, what do you mean by that? Like uh, with death anxiety, the revolving thought is I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And with time anxiety, it's like, there's not enough time. There's not enough time. There's not enough time. Um, and so how uh, yeah. do you mm-hmm. keep these two from kind of running into each other? <laughs> so how, I guess, did you shift that uh, swirl of death anxiety into not morphing into then time anxiety? Wow. I've never been asked that question before. That's beautiful. I think in regards to both death anxiety or time anxiety or anxiety in general, what helped me at first was to look at the situation objectively. And that's why You Might Die Tomorrow is such a like 
my logo is in black and white. Like it is out there. Like there's no questioning what this message is. And, and that's really what, like what I want to offer to other people is this objective look at like, Hey, I actually heard my, I was talking about you, my dad tomorrow with a friend recently. And he said, you know, what's really interesting. He said that we have a 0% chance of knowing when we die, but we have a 100% chance that we might die tomorrow. And I was just like, wow, that's, it just really struck me that, um, you know, the now is what, the now is what we have. And, um, that objective look at time and objective look at death, like, Hey, I don't know when I'm going to die. Um, that's the reality. I will die. I don't know when that's the reality. How am I going to react to that? And same with time. Like I, I will die. Um, time and death are related. It's like, why do we have the word lifetime? It's because they're so like closely related. Um, huh. yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, looking objectively at like the availability of time and the fact that nothing is guaranteed. And, um, it really just lights a fire under my butt because I get into decision par- paralysis with the best of them. Mm, yeah. I totally hear you on that one as well. Um, because I can sit and look at like 12 different options if you give me the time. I know. But if you tell me I, I don't have the time, I'm like, well, I'm going to, you know, it lights a fire, but it seems like um, it's turned into less of an internal anxiety and more of an external driver uh, mm-hmm. for you. I, I get this picture intuitively of like you taking time from your brain and literally putting it outside of your body. Like this doesn't belong in here. It belongs out here. And that's yeah. how you orchestrate it to make real change in your life. Um, I am ready to talk about the stickers. (laughs) I want to know all about them because I going onto your website, I've seen all the cool places that people have posted them, I guess, uh, to start off, where did the phrase you might die tomorrow come from? Uh, And then you kind of talked a little bit of about the black and white color choice, but kind of how did it grow from like, I have one of these to now they're all over the world. Mm hmm. Uh, yeah. So the, the inspiration for you might die tomorrow came, um, just a few days after Dan died on Everest because I was just in this like headspace of like, again, going through that objective reality of time and death and and everything. And it just, it just hit me that, Hey, um, I might die tomorrow. And, and that was the point that I knew I had turned the corner with the death anxiety as a result of like grappling with all of this, because, I was thinking you might die tomorrow for the whole time that I had death anxiety. That was like the full, like on the forefront of my mind. But when I looked at it in the new perspective after Dan's death, it was, oh, I might die tomorrow. And suddenly that was the most freeing thing I had ever thought of in my life. And, um, and so from there I, uh, created a a website, um, on my own and just started blogging and the sticker, uh, I chose the, the colors, like you said, black and white, because I wanted it to be stark and simple and I want people to take their own message. And I never, ever on my sticker would put like my website or my email or anything. It's the message stands on its own. And, um, uh, the, the sticker actually comes from like, it's, I didn't even know how to do graphic design. So I took a screenshot of the heading of my website, which was one of the Squarespace templates and, um, sent it off to have like 250 stickers made. And I took them on the trip that I took after I quit my job and, um, just started handing them out to people. And the response was just absolutely remarkable. And that was when I knew that I had tapped into something that people really wanted to have a framework to grapple with. If someone came up to you and said, I'm thinking about death for the very first time, and I'm looking for a guidance on how to figure out what my values are, so I can kind of realign or reorient, what would you tell them? Mm, I would tell them to try meditating on death uh, with a journal nearby and to close your eyes and imagine yourself on your deathbed looking back over your life and to write down the things that you felt were important in your life and that you did and things that you felt you were important in your life and that you didn't do. And you can start to hone in on the themes there that, um, that might have value for you. Um, those typically are pretty similar I found for most humans that I've met in this work uh, you know love humanity sharing our light with others enjoying life um, these these are the common themes that um, that humans have and the best way to I think find those values in the context of mortality is to to meditate 
that's a great look at um, kind of a where where do we begin? Death contemplation one hundred and one. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. Death contemplation 101 is like, you know, try your very best to look at it objectively and accept the facts and then figure out a way, decide you want to make the best of it and then figure out a way to make something good out of it. I like that response a lot more to death than death anxiety. There's more, I know our society values productiveness, but it seems like there's a better place to put your energy there. Um, Especially mm-hmm. in the aftermath of grief when you're already so short on energy. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Yeah. I like that reframing a lot, too. Um, the next question that's coming to me is, what, if anything, outside of you might die tomorrow, do you do to honor these four people in your life that you have lost? Yeah. The the first thing I'm doing is I'm finishing my book right now. And that's something where, uh, man, I had this experience where I thought that I had a brain eating amoeba, uh, which has a 99% fatality rate within 14 days. And the first thing that I thought when after I read the Google symptoms and was like, oh my God, I have like 90% of these. Um, The first thing I thought was, man, I've got to finish this book. I've got to share this story. I've got to honor these people who died and affected my life so positively. Um, And so for me, that's my meaningful thing is, um, is this project and, and this book. And I think the number one thing we can do to honor anyone who has, has died is to just enjoy the heck out of our lives, man, just like in the face of it all, like life is so hard. Uh, but if we can find enjoyment and, and like really feel that in us and, and assign value to, to enjoying our lives. Um, that's really the best thing that, that any of us can do. And that I try to do on a daily basis to, um, to honor those people. Can we jump back to the brain eating amoeba really quickly? What happened with that? <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, yeah, I was in New Zealand with my sister on my big trip. So after I, you know, left my job, my sister came to visit me when we were out there and we went in this geothermal pool on the top of this mountain. And, um, it's like, oh, if you insufflate the water, you could get this brain-eating amoeba. Of course, I did not insufflate the the water. Like, I kept my head above water, but it was like very steamy. And the next day, I started feeling achy, and my neck was hurting. And so I started googling the symptoms of this Neglaria fowlery, and they happened to match what I was feeling. And for those, and so that was like you're dead. You're supposed to be dead within like seven to 14 days. And those next seven days that I woke up and alive every morning, even though I thought I was going to die, were some of the best days of my life and the most clear days of my life. Like my sister and I had been arguing on the trip and suddenly I was like, I love you so much. Uh, and, and this is, this was one of the ways that I realized that death is so powerful is like, you know, even with a, a hypochondriacal near death experience like I had, um, which was totally manufactured in my brain. I did not have the amoeba. Um, but it but having that experience offered me this beautiful perspective and appreciation for life. I'm laughing, but also I have WebMD diagnosed myself to pieces. <laughs> uh especially when you've yeah. seen someone oh die. <laughs> especially when you've seen someone die. So I'm speaking to all of my grief goers listening right now. If you have WebMD or Google diagnosed yourselves, you are not alone. So yeah. yes, I totally thanks Google. This. Thanks Google. <laughs> it's it's a blessing and a curse in so many ways because I know I'm like here's so many people listening have found this podcast on Google, but at the same time we also convince ourselves we're dying on Google. <laughs> so I sit know. wisely. I can have a silver lining. Though. Yes, I want to ask you uh, another question that I wrote down kind of in the early stages of your speaking because I imagine that you kind of like me have pondered this uh, a lot already. And that is, what would you like to die doing? Or how would you like to die? Mm, How would I like to die? I I went to this um, meetup group. There's this meetup group in Austin that I just came upon called Death Matters. And I expected it to be like in a dark basement. And it was like a few people like, you know, you know, grieving. And it ended up being this group of 19 you know, vibrant people who had all experienced death and grief in their lives or passionate about the idea of like shining a light on mortality awareness. And um, we had this like group conversation. And one of the questions was, 
would you rather die a um you know an unexpected and swift death or a um a longer term death and um I, I had to be vulnerable on that because I was like, well, my ego says unexpected death uh, because, um, you know, uh, people just um, have have the reaction and um, and, you know, you you it's always nice to think about going, uh, you know, without any pain. But but again, like I have this ever since I had my realization, I had a new outlook on challenge in life. Um, and I'm sure I'll be thrown challenges, which I, uh, am unsure that I'll be able to get through, but, but in general, I try to like, uh, have a positive relationship with challenge. And I think if I were to die, um, of say like, um, a, a terminal illness where I had time to contemplate and think about it, that would kind of be like the ultimate, um, like personal research or contemplation of my lifelong work of um, like researching and spreading the idea of mortality awareness. So I think I would want to die um, having, having the time to meditate on and really feel and, and share with the world uh, my experience. There are several authors that have died in that fashion and then have had books published posthumously. So after their deaths, um, the first one that comes to mind for me is Elizabeth Kubler Ross, who a lot of the grief community shames because she is like the head honcho inventor of the five stages. Uh, I'll say right here and now I've personally read her books and she's like the media kind of took it and ran with it. So they're more like the five buckets of grief, but the way that, that it's been misconstrued through the years, uh, has kind of, um, misrepresented her, her work and her studies, but on, in her book, not on, um, not on death and dying, but I believe her book is called On Grief and Grieving. She has a dear friend named David Kessler who still is around in the world. He's like Oprah's grief guy. And uh, oh. he does an introduction for her about witnessing her in the last months of her life. And she had studied death for so long, she had a lot of time to think about how she wanted to die. And I, if my memory is serving me correctly, which I think it is, she died in her house in front of this really big picture window and every guest that came into the home, she just requested that they bring flowers. And so she was just surrounded by natural beauty. And I believe she had some form of cancer. Um, and so it was one of those things where she had time to think about death, to say goodbye, to continue to share wisdom in the midst of her pain and in the midst of her dying. Uh, and sometimes I think on that, I'm like, that seems a little too good to be true. But at the same time, I'm like, if she could do it, maybe maybe that's yeah, a possibility for me it's too. Beautiful. Why not? Um, you might die tomorrow. So maybe, mm -hmm. you know, maybe we can go that way. Um, but that's one of many. There's also others in like when breath becomes air. Oh, um, beautiful. I just are, read oh, that again. Oh my God. Like, made me, my coworker I recommended it, again, it and yeah. didn't tell me what it was. And then I was like, oh no. <laughs> I know. I it's so, so beautiful. Um, it was sensational. And there's so many books that exist in the grief sphere where people are actually looking at themselves as they're dying, which is just a whole wild other genre of books I'd never considered. Yeah. And when we get to the, like the, like what wisdom I can share portion of this podcast, I'll talk a little bit about my deathbed meditation that I created and facilitate. Um, and that has some, um, some commentary in there about creating that like safe space of your, um, of your own death. Yeah. Well, let's jump into that then. That seems like a good transition point for it. Yeah. So I, um, when I was like starting to do all of this research on, uh, you know, I had my realization and I started to do all of this research on mortality awareness. I at first was like, oh, I'm probably the first person to ever like come up with this amazing thing that's changed my life. And then of course, like every writer and like philosopher and uh, you and, uh, you know, our neighbor down the street, everyone has has thought about mortality. And a lot of people have hit on this idea that death is life's greatest teacher. And, um, and so I started doing this thing that I like eventually started calling the deathbed gut check, which was like, when I was faced with the decision that I didn't know like which direction to go in my life. I was like, how do I apply the wisdom of death to this decision? Like I am trapped in decision paralysis and this sucks. So, um, what can I do? And so the thing that I just started doing was I would 
when I was faced with a decision like this, I would close my eyes and I would imagine myself on my deathbed. And mine is either like on the beach or in like a beautiful room, like Elizabeth Kubler Ross, like facing a forest with lots of natural light. And I would, um, I would imagine myself looking back from the perspective of my deathbed, looking back back in the present moment at the decision that I had to make. And I would imagine like, oh, how would I feel from my deathbed if I had chosen option A? And then I take a second and and feel how my body viscerally relax. Like in my gut, do I feel like a heavy pit or do I feel light and free? Um, And then I do the same thing for option B. And almost always I'm able to like like hone in on um, either a negative or a positive sensation in my body that tells me which is the right way to go because in death we have this wisdom like no other like like I said everything falls away all the you know worry about what people think of us and um like the perspective that we don't have and um and so I started doing this deathbed gut check and it was so valuable it just took me like 5 seconds i would got to the point where i was doing it like almost every day for different varying like levels of decision making and then i um created, I started looking up like, oh, well, what if I did a meditation about my deathbed um, and get like a greater, longer perspective on my life? And so I created one. That is too cool to me because I guess just like the cult sticker following, I've never heard it phrased that way before, a deathbed meditation. And I think that's something that's simple enough to grasp onto without going too deep into the morbidity of it. Um, and that's that's tremendously helpful. I really like how you phrase that. Well, Kate, I want to know where the listeners of this podcast can find you and your work as well as your forthcoming book, You Might Die Tomorrow. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. The deathbed meditation is something that I facilitate either uh, virtually or in person. And you can go to youmightdietomorrow.com, my website, and learn more about uh, sign up for the deathbed meditation, um, get some stickers, uh, or send me a note. And um, I have a really vibrant community on Facebook and on Instagram. And my book, uh, like I said, kind of my life's work, this thing that's so important to me, is in um, the final stages now and will be hopefully coming out this summer. Yay. I'm doing a sparkly fingers cheer from over here. You can't see it, but I'm so excited. (laughs) Me too. I appreciate it. Oh my gosh. Kate, thank you so much for coming on, coming back today and sharing uh, your wisdom, kind of a reframing of death anxiety to a high, high value on time and life. Yeah. And if, if the listeners take nothing else away from the talk today, it's just that just enjoy your life, please. Uh, we don't know how much time we have and um, the best thing that we can do is to have fun every single day. So that's all for this episode of coming back. Thank you so, so much to Kate Manser for coming on the show and laughing a lot with me today. I so, so appreciate you and your energy. Kate came back by recognizing that she might die tomorrow, and by transmuting her death anxiety into an exterior force that lit a fire under her butt to make decisions about how she wanted to live her life. You can find a link to Kate's website where you can get your hands on You Might Die Tomorrow stickers in the show notes. For grief support beyond this podcast, go to patreon.com slash Shelby Forsythia, where you can pledge for as little as $1 per month to receive instant access to a monthly grief support group with me. This month's hangout is on January 28th at 8 o'clock p.m. Central. If you liked what you heard today, you can support Coming Back by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and by telling a friend about Coming Back, because you never know what someone you love is going through. Thank you always to Mr. Addie Goldstein, who composed our theme music. You can find me on Facebook at Shelby for Scythia, Intuitive Grief Guide, Instagram at Grief Guide Shelby for Scythia, or simply shelbyforsythia.com. If you'd like to leave a question or a comment for a future show, leave a voicemail or text 312-725-3043 or email me at shelby at shelbyforsythia.com. As always, my dear grief growers, it was beautiful sharing this space and time with you today. I see you. I am proud of you and the work that you're doing in the world. And I love you. Because even through grief, we are growing.